Today, we discuss the modern U.S. agriculture population, current events surrounding the dwindling beef population, and the greenhouse gas concerns related to beef production. Welcome to Hash Knife Hangouts. I'm Kalen. My co-host and father is Brandon. Today's lovely surprise is my mother, Lisa. If you enjoy the channel, please take a moment to hit like. And if you enjoy our stuff, click the subscribe button too. Farming and ranching populations, beef populations, and greenhouse gases. Let's get started. Uh, today's tweet I found, I wanted to share. Ranching isn't just a job. It's a lifestyle that is often passed down from one generation to the next. And I felt like that was important for what we were going to discuss today. So I'm going to start with something that I think really gets into the down and dirty of that subject is our first topic, which is the ranching populations and farming populations throughout the United States. Would you be surprised? I'm just going to say a yes or no with my parents real quick. Would you be surprised if somebody like myself told the two of you that 10.6% of workers in the United States work directly with or indirectly with? the agriculture industry. I don't think I'd be surprised by that number. Not when it's you include the indirect. Yeah. Because yeah. it's got and a big that, ripple effect. Yeah. And that's where it is. 1.3% is on the farms and ranches. Mm -hmm. yeah. 0.5 is within forestry and fishing. 2.9% is food and beverage, textiles and manufacturing, and then food and beverage stores. And then 5.9% is food services, eating, and drinking places. So bars. So which of those would include like supplies for, because they work with agriculture. You know, I'm thinking of the um, implement dealers as well sure. as like the local. Manufacturing. I think, so. I think that falls, yeah, within the 2.9% the okay. of food and beverage and then textiles and manufacturing. That, so, yeah, that's what yeah. I would guess. But yeah. That's what I would I guess. Because I would have other... thought that'd be a little bigger. Yeah, and that, that that comes from I I can do what I normally do. Links in the the comment below for sources. That's coming directly from the USDA though. Uh, dot gov. Mm. So it's I mean it's metrics. You can't really get past that. The other thing too that I wanted to share was a weekly business. Actually, it's more like a daily business letter that I get in the mail in the email every day. This came from Charter C H A R T R. Um, it's a company that does a lot of just information for businesses relating to things specifically through bar graphs, line graphs, pie graphs. Right up whatever. your alley. Yeah. I love looking at the the colors and the shapes, you know? So uh, this one, what they did was they, they put the title. It says, are they worth it? The professions America thinks are overpaid. And I'll top, I'll tell you the top two that they think are overpaid. So very overpaid or somewhat overpaid 78% both was professional athletes and politicians yep. and a negligible amount. There's not even a percentage on the side says very or somewhat underpaid. <laughs> like there's it's there, but you can't read it. <laughs> well, that'd and be the athletes and politicians themselves. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, CEOs come in shortly after them at 76% overpaid, but then you go at the bottom and the top, the bottom two farmers and I'll throw ranchers in there too, because people often just, Lump them together. Yeah. Uh, farmers are second lowest. Factory workers are the lowest. So farmers came in at six percent overpaid, is what people think, and five mm. percent think factory workers are overpaid. Now go to the opposite side of the spectrum. Sixty-eight percent of people, this is more, say they are very or somewhat under underpaid when it comes to farmers, and only fifty-eight percent. So sixty-eight versus fifty-eight percent people think factory workers are. So I feel like that's very interesting. I'll make sure that graphics up there too, so people can see it. Um, but it's very interesting to see that <laughs> uh, clearly some of the more important people, which we found out during 2020, you know, mm -hmm. retail register cashiers and everything, they're actually pretty important and people don't consider that. And yet the politicians and the professional athletes get paid the most when it comes to our country. So with that, our population continues to dwindle in the agriculture industry as generations begin to leave their families and the old and the 
the the fathers and mothers and the grandparents are all still holding on to an extent, but they're not necessarily going to be able to hold on forever. So I wanted to get your thoughts on kind of the the agriculture population and uh, where we're at right now. Well, I think what's the average right now? Fifty eight for yeah, uh, about that I think. Yeah, so, I can I mean, Google that real quick too. That's uh, not someone that's necessarily in their prime. They're they're uh, uh, um, middle aged, washed up. Is that <laughs> what you're but I'm just saying, you know, they're they're not twenty something, thirty something that uh, um, have a little more energy than we do. Um, I'm 29 years old. It's the lifestyle that made me look like. Yeah, this. I know, and I'm sure I was a big part of that. Yeah. But um, 57.5 years old. That's okay. what it says. Yeah. And um, what I think is a big issue, and this is something I've seen at different times in my life, but I see it much more so now because of where we're at, is how many people had a career or a job and maybe they worked for 15 years, maybe it was 25 or 30, and then moved into working the family operation. They were doing it on the side all the time, weekends, evenings, that kind of thing. And then um, took it over basically as their parents aged out and um, helped those parents as they were aging. And so that's why the numbers aren't there. Younger people like your generation and younger, you kind of, I'm kind of seeing a resurgence to a point, but yet there's a lot of them. They're like, heck with this. I'm not doing this for the rest of my life. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, to, to echo that, there was another tweet, which I don't even know if they're called tweets anymore. Twitter changed this thing to X and I have to redo digital logos and all that. I digress. Um, This, this person posted ranch life is a little weird and that's okay. I can't wait to retire actually translates into, I can't wait to ranch without working any other jobs. And this, mm -hmm. well, this is what I call the perfect day off. And it shows them doing ranch work with their, their cattle. So I, I think that kind of echoes what you're saying is yeah. <laughs> you have to do two jobs to keep you. It's not just right. like you get to stay well, we at have, home at the farmer ranch and work. We have folks that we've known for years and years and, um, their kids grew up with you guys. And, yeah. um, he worked a job in town. So does she, she continues to, but he was in that job for a good 15 years before he felt he had the opportunity and things were in place that he could then go full time on the farm and ranch that they have. And he was able to help his dad at that time who would have been 60 ish yeah. and yeah. now continues uh, to do that. And the son is in the family uh, farm business now. And fortunately he was interested in doing it because there's no way his dad could do everything that he's doing now, but right. still it took that jump start of many years before he financially could go to the farm and ranch full time. Yeah, and that's no. not atypical. No, but, and there's a, there's a little bit of a difference between that too. You start out Really, if you're growing up in it, you're you are an apprentice, whether you realize it or not. Yeah, yeah that's it's an true. apprenticeship type of uh, situation. But then you get through school, you've spent your entire life up until 18 years old uh, working this farm or ranch, and then reality hits. A lot of times, it's not big enough for everybody. Yeah, is in our case, yeah. and so, but sometimes it is. When it is, a lot of times these kids that are graduating from high school and want to be a part of it, they move on to college to come back with the intention of with either a, a ag business degree or, you know, uh, like your brother with his, you know, you got, you're getting your MBA. Yeah. Your brother has got his, his degree in, in uh, range you know, rangeland management. So it's an apprenticeship and then it's topped off with, formal education to try to marry the both of those together in order to make a place that is sustainable and also um profitable you hope <laughs> um we recently had a guy come and look at a heating system to put in the, the ranch house here 
interestingly enough, I, you know, we're talking and I saw where he was from and I asked him his name and he told me there's a very large farming operation in that area. Yep. And I, and I mentioned, I saw, like, you know, he goes, yeah, he says, I, I quit doing it. He said, I went, and this guy's probably 40. Maybe. Yeah. I'd say. Yeah. That's and what I, I would have said. Cause I was there about 45. Yeah, you were there. That's right. Yeah. 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 And he said, uh, he said, yeah, he said, it's unbelievable. He says, I am so busy doing this, but the work is still way easier than, than the farming. And, yeah. the and, he still, and, stress. and he still and goes home to help. He still has to go home to help, but it's even with that, with a yeah. job that he's working, yep. you know, 12, 14 hours a day is still easier than the farming and ranching. So. Well, and I think part of that stress comes from, too, the fact that, for example, Braden less so with his degree, because my bachelor's is absolutely useless unless you pursue other things after it. But, uh, yeah, sorry, any history majors out there, welcome to reality uh but the but the thing is with his rangeland his is useful for what he's doing right now which is firefighting and that's fine i don't know if that's a long-term thing for him because you know those guys are to an extent they're looked at almost like the military once they hit their 40s they're kind of washed up uh but but like with me mba or somebody with a business or an egg business or egg investment stuff like that you can turn that and you can do an outside job that's so it's applicable both to home and outside. Right. So to your point about the less stress, I think it also comes from the stress is more financial knowing right. I can get a steady income and know that's going to hit my bank every two weeks versus I don't know if the markets are going to crash this year or if they're going to surge and they're going to yeah. get you know, back to well, break even and well, break even is actually going to pay cost. off stuff from the last couple of years that we lost, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, no, that's right. I think that's kind of where it sits, but, um, yeah, I, I think that's a good point too. The, the hard part is, I think what you're saying though, too, is the, the joining of the skills with the desire to be there, but knowing that sometimes it just doesn't work too. <laughs> Right. Well, and it, and yeah. it's it's harder and harder to make a living at it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and well, and to to be actually to keep it sustainable. Yeah. That's, well, and I try to. There's gonna be a there's gonna be a crash at some point, and there already has people have been going out of business. Yeah. Yeah, and that that's what's worrisome too is, I'm reading. Social media is fantastic for some of the content we create because I'm able to see things. I'm like, hey, let's discuss it. It's more of a current event or, hey, this is something that happens that I think is a good five minute or 15 minute tidbit with our shorter episodes. But the problem is it's also that depressing hole that you see sometimes, too, which is today's theme on Twitter or X, whatever it's called now, was um, the fact that land prices and and the business com- continues to increase and people can't get the return on that investment that they need right. one one is somebody is saying about just land prices another person was saying stuff about their equipment they said you know as long as we kept expanding and we've had this conversation before as long as you keep getting bigger you're okay but as soon as you hit that plateau your overhead suddenly isn't making up for it and you're gonna start crashing financially right yeah. and so it kind of makes sense because you see that with the government debt alexander hamilton had that you know you got to get you got to have debt to get loans and so on and so, you know, to, to make the finances work. So that makes sense in that regard. But then the third part too, was a discussion that somebody posted about, I think Senator Chuck Grassley from Iowa made something about a recent thing, essentially capping subsidies and um, relief packages to bigger farms and ranches that are essentially corporate owned, right? They've, mm-hmm. It's like Tyson Farms or Cargill Meats and stuff like that. They've got those things that they've brought together and they're essentially leveraging the system against itself to support them. And so the intent, if you read it, is to try and cap that so it doesn't keep helping the big guys run out the little guys. But at the same time, people in the comments are going, listen, like this is a fantastic idea, but I think it's a lot of smoke and mirrors because we can't set our prices when we can't set our prices. Like that's what results in the issues you're seeing in the last three years. People are selling at whatever they have to, because that's what it is. They don't have an option. And now this is the outcome, which is you just have to deal with what it is. Yeah, no, it's, 
you have and you have several parts to that as an operator. Um, for us, we've got a family place that is multi generational, has been, and um, so there's a very emotional uh, tie to that personally. And a lot of people are like that. You you yeah. you, you know you have multi generations of this apprenticeship I talked about. And then when you can no longer make that, or it's getting to where um, it's you're struggling, uh, you're you're starting to age out, you can't do it, uh, or you see that you're going to lose the place. Where are you going to go? Yeah. What are you going to do? And then you take a look at statistics of the suicide rate between on farmers and ranchers. Yeah. Very high. It's super high for per capita. It's very high. So. Um, you know that's it's a it, it's a landmine that is always been there. I can remember during the eighties, three and uh, a half times higher than the uh, national average in the United States. Three and a half times. The suicide rate for farmers and ranchers is three and a half times higher among the general population, according to National Rural Health Association, and that They've was a doing... study done between two thousand and two thousand eighteen. They've been doing a lot of campaigning locally, at least, about yep. if you need help, call kind of thing. Yep. How many farmers or ranchers, if they're struggling in their head, are you going to call that you know of? It's not, not it's not, you that's not a cultural thing. That, that's you something s- that people yeah. don't understand. It's a cultural thing. You yeah. got a problem, you solve it You're on yep. your own. Nobody's going to help you. Yep. So anyway, yeah. Um, but, but those are some of the, you know, th- it's not just a business that you can, you know, have a franchise for and if you don't make it mm, okay well we gotta move on to something else uh, you're still living in, in your house probably um hopefully hopefully that isn't the case on a farmer ranch you lose it you can't you stay everything it's every right. everything you've ever had is all tied up into it yeah. so that and that those are high stakes those are very high stakes oh absolutely i mean to an extent your your chips are all, all you're full fully in every hand that's dealt like it's well, not and, just like you're you, throwing something here or there like you're always completely yes and, and you hear about people who are entrepreneurs that took a chance and they risked everything to make something happen yeah good for them that worked every day is a risk in this industry yeah. you know yeah. and it's all in risk it's not just oh we're going to risk a little bit of it it's everything so yeah. there's that issue as well that people don't, I don't think, quite understand unless they're in it. And then they realize it and uh, then, it's, then it's probably too late. It's like, oh, crap, what have I done? You know? Yeah, no, I, I agree. Um, we're going to move on to the cattle population and it's dwindling. It's down 3%. Numbers. Yeah. Uh, I guarantee low. we're going to end up having this conversation. It's August, so <laughs> about two Two months probably when we sell the calves, um, because more than likely, more than likely, knock on wood, uh, we will have much better prices than the last couple of years. But again, to the conversation, to the the statement I said a few minutes before, any profit that we might make is just going to go back to reimbursing essentially the losses that we had the last couple of years. Um, And so. Oh man, this got me heated a couple of years ago on Twitter. Uh, somebody said, you know, you guys are complaining about the prices now, but I didn't hear you complaining in 2014 when they were high. I'm like, listen, guy, like it's not, it's not just that year. Like you keep forgetting that it's a, it's a trough and a peak thing. Like we lose a lot of money every year and then we might make a couple good years to try and reimburse that. It's not like we just surge ahead. So these are long troughs with short peaks. Yeah, so like cool, cool your jets up, bro. Um, I'm gonna real quick. I'm gonna well verbatim. You know, go ahead. Can I, if I can interrupt, and the problem is he's probably viewing that from a consumer point right. of view. Sure. Which you go to the grocery store and you see these outrageous prices. I was at the grocery store yesterday and I was looking, and I was like, "Holy smokes!" Problem yeah. is that does not transfer to what the producer's making. Right. There's such a, you know, and we've, you've talked about it before that huge disparage number between what those packers are getting and what the producers getting. Um, yeah. That's part of the problem because it's like fake news to the public. They think because they're paying that at the um, grocery store that producers are getting that 
at the other end. Well, and I think no, there's I, also I another another part of that that we want to promote our own uh, products as yeah. as producers in the U.S. And Terrific. we fight hard to do that. And we fight hard to make sure that people understand that this is a safe food source. It's in the U.S. This is ranch raised in the, in the U.S. And we have that on the package. People don't think that there's a middleman in there or two or, six. or three or six. They, they think, think it oh, goes straight from us to Walmart or straight from right. us. And to so we're making Costco. all of this profit off of this. Yeah. You know, so there's a little bit of a disconnect there that I think we we probably inadvertently set that message yeah. that it's us even though we want yeah. you to buy our beef that oh yeah we're making all the profit off this off this right. it's, and it's not well pushing it back to the cattle population i'm going to read a small article verbatim um because it's pretty short so i think it's important to what i'm trying to get to about the cattle population uh the title is it's out of successful farming and it was dated uh about nine days ago july 21st 2023 it says U.S. beef cow herd falls to 52-year low, squeezing meat packers. And it says it's by Reuters, so it's a fairly reputable source. U.S. farmers are raising the fewest beef cows since at least 1971. Government data released on Friday showed as drought conditions whittled herds, likely boosting costs for meat packers that slaughter the animals into steak and hamburgers. There's your middleman. Chicago, July 21. U.S. farmers are raising the fewest beef cows since at least 1971, as the government released Friday, showing through the drought conditions, whittled herds, likely boosting costs for meat packers. We just covered that. I don't know why they did that twice. There are 29.4 million beef cows as of July 1st, down 2.6%. That's a lot. From a year earlier, the U.S. Department of Agriculture said in a biannual report. It was the smallest herd for that date since the government began keeping records 52 years ago and reflected a fifth year of declining beef cow numbers. Annual records of the herd size as of January 1 of 2023, I'll add, go back farther and the number of beef cows at the start of this year was the lowest since 1962 at 28.9 million head. Ranchers have increasingly sent cows to slaughter as dry weather Reduce the amount of pasture available for grazing. Covered that the last couple of years. Tight supplies mean meat processors like Tyson Foods, Cargill, and JBS SA's U.S. unit will pay elevated prices for cattle until producers start the year's long process of rebuilding the herd in a let's say. Longer term plans for new slaughter plants to open in coming years indicate processors will also increasingly need to compete with each other to buy limited numbers of cattle. Shocker. Uh, the next two to three years are going to be a bloodbath for packer margins. I don't believe that, said mm -hmm. Rich Nelson, chief strategist for brokerage Allendale. The USDA in a separate report said producers placed 1.68 million cattle in feedlots in June to fatten them up for slaughter, up 3% from 2022. Again, a huge number when it comes to cattle herds. Analysts on average had expected placements to decline 1.6% from last year. You can't do that when people are going out of business and it's a drought. Uh, the increased signal that there is still not enough pasture, there it is, for cattle to graze on due to dry weather. So producers put the animals in feedlots instead. Analysts say the dynamic is not there yet where you're going to see a real shortfall in the number of cattle going on feed, says uh, Kalo economist for steiner consulting so that's the the article hmm. that's why i wanted to do it because it's pretty short again okay. it, it highlights we're getting squeezed out financially and the land can't produce or sustain the animals so what are people forced to do either sell completely out or liquidate herds in order to float by until they can start over again it, there's a couple of false premises in in this story uh written obviously by the marketing department of a couple of packers who is read that again? Who's being squeezed? The Packers? No, they're yeah. not. The Packers have been yeah. doing the squeezing. Mm -hmm. That is yeah. completely false. What what it really should say is the Packers will likely return to Reduce. margins they saw before pandemic era economies. They're going to reduce well, their their profit yes. a little bit. The, yeah. Well, yeah. and yes, and and who is doing the squeezing? And it isn't just the drought conditions. Yes, it is. It's a major. It's a major factor. But you've also got high fuel prices. Yeah, 
there's, that is, that is e- there's economic stuff too, but I, yes. I'm trying to focus just on the agriculture aspect. I get it. That's an outside influence that, that does impact. But it directly influences. And, it's, yeah, and but, the other part of that is, is look at the prices that these packers are, are squeezing. They're doing the squeezing. They're not being yeah. squeezed. They are squeezing uh, backgrounders for profit. And, and that trickles down to the producer. When you cannot uh, produce an animal at a profit, what are you going to do? Just as you said at the end of that, you're going to have to sell it. You've got no choice. Right. You, you've got to try to hang on. So, you know, you've got you've got this squeezing going on the wrong direction. And it's not the packers that are flooding the market with these cattle. It's the producer. Yeah. So, well, and that, yeah, but that, that goes yeah. back to the numbers. So l- looking at that, right, the, the drought, it, let's keep in mind, the drought is not just regional. A lot of the times it'll be right. more nor- northern. So the southern guys will get uh, influx into the market. And so they'll make the money more or less because the north just is struggling. Or it'll be inverted. That that happened to us too. The south was really struggling there for a couple of years because they had bad droughts. And we made out okay with prices. We essentially broke even. We were okay. Um, But this time, the last two to three years, depending on where you're at, it has been consistent Whites from red. Montana down to Texas mm-hmm. and all the way over to Iowa and Missouri, that entire Midwest region is completely shut out with drought. It doesn't matter where you're at. There might right. be a couple spots here and there that they're lucky because they get some supercells that come in regularly and they hit them really well. But other than that, when it comes to the cattle, everybody's suffering. And so everybody is going to market. So instead of a 1.6% herd input of the cattle they're doubling it to three percent cattle input and that's what's that's what's doing a lot of this push but again to your point it's not the packers getting squeezed by any means i think they're just returning back to revenue sources that they had three four years ago that they're not used to now because they've been gouging people and that's right. that's well, a three four years ago they were gouging it just wasn't quite as egregious as exorbitant yes i yeah. agree I love them Packers. It's just frustrating because I I think I think you nailed it. The marketing department got hold of that and did a fantastic job, by the way. Congratulations, folks. <laughs> but um yeah, no. Because that and that's why people will see uh last year our I think our herd sold for roughly one forty to one forty five hundred weight. Is that is that about right? If I remember right. About right. Okay. This year, what they're looking at, roughly speaking, that was is, the steers. By the way, the the heifers were less than that. They're about a eight cents less. Okay. We'll we'll stick with that though. Like one forty yeah. is what we'll call it. One forty yeah. hundred weight. So every hundred pounds, you're getting one hundred forty dollars. Right. This year, they're looking at roughly, again, knock on wood, two forty to two fifty. That's what it's been weight. looking at right now. So. Here's the, the problem. Reason, Things change between July, August, and when we do. sell. Right. You know. They do, and and I agree, and that's why I say we we keep knocking on wood. But the the problem, like people are like, well, that they're you're gonna start making that that price. You're gonna you're gonna make a, a huge um in, increase in profit this year. Okay, stop and smell the roses. But at the same time, look through some reality colored glasses rather than rose colored ones. And what's going to happen? There's two things. Uh, first off, like I said, that money is going to go back towards recouping the losses for the last three to four hard years, not mm-hmm. to include the four to five eh, kind of hard Mediocre years, before, years that. before that. Yeah. Now, now that's one. The second is also suddenly the government's going to look at you and go, hey, you made a big profit. And now you either... This is the trick that farmers and ranchers have to deal with too. Do I suck it up and take the hit and taxes or do I make a big purchase now and say, that's, you know, that's my equipment or whatever to knock right. that revenue and that profit back to try and cut into the Counteract, tax hit yeah, the and, loss. And, and, and live with that over depreciation for the next 10 years. Right. Right. Especially right now with vehicle prices, the way they are. Right. Goodness yeah. gracious. I mean, Tell you me guys. That just about picked up a hundred a, a six figure pickup with all the stuff that you guys had to 
deal with on that. But yeah, I digress. All right, moving on. Um, hopefully it's a 30 year investment. Yeah, I'm hoping so. All right. The next one's gonna be something that I again um I saw it on Twitter, but we had we were gonna discuss it anyway, and I'm glad we did. This is kind of good timing because the person actually had some back and forth with me on it and and wanted to see what we thought about it. And we've talked about this with technology in general, but RFID tags on cattle. Mm. I've got three sources here. <laughs> uh, one of them, let me let me pull so this up real quick. I should just insert here. That degree wasn't totally uh, worthless. You uh, are able to uh, research and um, cite your sources very uh, well. And I think it's from lots and lots of practice. <laughs> Yeah, you could probably say that. <laughs> um, I'll start with the RFID implement implementation timeline. In December of 2019, uh, the USDA stopped providing free metal tags, and they were starting to force a state by state basis of authorized um things for tagging, which is the RFID. In January of 2021. Uh, metal ear tag production, it says, no longer was permitted by the USDA whatsoever, and veterinarians and producers could not apply metal tags for official ID and must use uh, the RFID tags only. And then and January of this year, 2023, here's what it says. RFID tags will be required for beef and dairy cattle and bison moving across state lines and meeting the requirements. Animals previously tagged with metal ear tags must be retagged with official RFID tags to move interstate. Cattle feeder and animals moved directly to slaughter are not subject to the RFID requirements. And I will also re remind people that this is a uh, application for livestock that is only beef cattle, sexually intact, over 18 months old, and transported again interstate. So if it's within the state, within the state of Montana, you are fine. If it's going from Montana to Wyoming, Montana to Idaho, Montana to the North or South Dakota, you got to have the RFID tags. Um, somebody this said, is for brucellosis tracking. This is the, the metal tags were for bangs, vaccinations, brucellosis. Here's my skepticism with that. And this is what I put on the um, the Twitter sphere because I, I want to make sure that I, I read this appropriately because I don't want to say things I didn't. And the guy was, he essentially posed the question. He goes, what, what's up, what's up with the RFID tags? Like why, why do we, what, what's the issue with them? What's the pros for them and everything. And again, going back to what you and I had discussed that before was it's all about metrics, like head per acre taxes, how to best manage your herd. And I put in there too much government, too much government oversight is what it was. Yeah. So in quote, metrics, dot, 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 head per acre, taxes, how to best manage your herd, too much of government oversight. That was it. And he goes, he he actually quote tweeted it, which is he took that exact thing, tweeted it and put a, a tagline with it and said, talking about RFID tags, I don't understand why we would ever need to tag cows that don't leave the ranch until I read this. It's not about disease traceability. It's about traceability. Yes. And I'm like, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely, man. Like that, And that's where I have the issue. We've had this discussion with satellite um useful because we talked about use of nasa and stuff for crops mm -hmm. fantastic for seeing you know maybe how to optimize your land and whatnot but if you have something like right now with a drought oh you clearly can't manage your land like you don't know how to make sure that it stays sustainable and it, it helps we'll get to this too helps negate greenhouse gases and etc cetera, etc cetera. like you clearly can't do what you're doing you're, you clearly don't know what you're doing. So the government needs to step in and now take over and show you how to do this. And that's where I have the issue with it. Don't think it can't happen because what they'll do, they, they'll do it through the EPA as well. And, uh, right. oh, oh, you, you're not managing your place. You don't have enough grass here. So that's going to affect this wetlands, which exactly. is protected. Right. Yeah. Or some species. What have I called it before? The ruby need uh prairie spider you know i yeah. mean just, just make it up whatever it is never yeah. heard of it before well the government's seen it <laughs> one one once yeah. yeah so you are now under the under the protection because that's what the government does it protects you right 
in against yourself. Well, and 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 again, the the thing that I gotta say is I think the intention of tracking disease issues, making sure animals are, uh, you know, animal welfare too. We've had discussed that also. The the various ways you can implement and use RFID tags to properly essentially manage husbandry of livestock and ensure that everything is done with the best and most optimal effect. I agree with, I think that's fantastic, but it again goes back to the slippery slope of, I'm just always concerned that now somebody's going to exaggerate something or they're going to flip it and alter it enough that they can add in or subtract words to a bill to make an intent completely change course 180 degrees. And Happens now you're all going the, time. the opposite way. Happens mm-hmm. all the time. Yeah. That's, that's just where I see it, honestly. Yeah. And I don't, man, there's just Remember, so much issue I have with it. The government was wanting to do this with horses. Oh, know, were 15, they? 20 years ago. Remember with uh, chips, RFID chips in horses. I mean, you can do it with the, you know, pets, cats and dogs. So yeah. Right. But they were going to make that mandatory, and we fought that back. Um, and it, it's it's nothing more than tracking everything. If you if if you're talking about putting a little mark in your hand or you know a chip in you, what's the difference between if you can't do that to the people, but you do that to everything they own, or yeah. what's important to them? You're doing the same thing. Yeah. Right. I mean, people would argue you already do that willingly when you have a cell phone so, well yeah. in a way you do uh it, when you're given the choice to you you do this buy the cell phone you need this okay well along with that if you want to buy this this is what you have to agree to it's not necessarily voluntary sure you can choose not to buy by the phone it's about it's there because we're going to put it there and you're going to take it and you're going to like it yeah no i agree that makes sense too um now, the, the other thing that I had that I wanted to speak about this was I said it's applicable to beef cattle who are being transported interstate, right? Well, it's also a matter of time. Let's let's switch this back to financial that we were just left with the, the lands and, and the uses of them. It's going to also be to the point where, OK, if we're not the ones putting the RFID tags on our cattle, it will be financially bestowed upon us. Once we sell said cattle, so let's say, hey, you get just say a hundred dollars a head. You get a hundred dollars a head every time you sell them, but five dollars of that is now gonna go towards us yes. removing the tag you have on that animal and implementing the RFID tag. I, I see a water down and a trickle effect of mm-hmm. what's gonna happen. We already have it with beef checkoff, so that, why wouldn't they that, just that add that into it, you know? Right. Yep. Instead of a instead of a dollar per head for the beef checkoff, now it becomes a dollar for a checkoff and fifty cents for RFID implementation. Or more. Or more. Yeah. That's that's where I also see this going. And I'm yep. like, you just keep like you said, you have the choice to sell that cow or that heifer or right. that steer. But when you're forced to also do something else in conjunction with that that you don't necessarily agree with, is that really voluntary? Right. I don't no. think so. What is uh what, what, whose who's issue is it to fix when a tag doesn't work? Who makes also the tags? What yeah. if you get a whole bunch of tags that are corrupted somehow sure. and don't work? Now what? Now is that a fine that you're going to have to be assessed because you didn't comply? Yeah. That's, that's next point. because there's going to be enforcement to it. Which, I mean, that falls down into vaccines too. What happens when you get a, a bad vaccine and it kills half your hurt? You know, guess who yeah. takes that loss? It's never, never the the pharmaceutical company that created that. No. <laughs> never. It's always the farmer or rancher. Right. Uh. All right. Okay. So that happened. That that very thing happened locally here when my grandpa was working for a guy up uh, north of town. A guy. He's still around. Yeah. And we we branded vaccinated, and a few days later, three four days later, we started having calves drop dead everywhere. And it was a bad batch uh, of vaccine. Uh, how, how, oh, it was horrible. I mean, well, to us, growing, it's clear because there's nothing else that's changed other than that vaccine. Right. The, yeah. And and this was not happening just there, but it was happening other places traced back to 
the pharmaceutical, the, well, the they, they, they ended up paying for some of the losses. Well, that's not true. They end up paying for some of these, these animals, these calves, at that moment's value. Hmm. That is not what you're going to realize at the end of summer. And it was no. only a percentage of that. So all it did was it was was re- help reduce the giant loss a little bit, not yeah. near enough um, to make a difference. Yeah, if that calf's only let's say half the size that it could be, you're only going to p- make the half the potential that it could make, right? Uh, it looks like you froze up. So hold on. you know, a couple, hundred pounds? a couple hundred pounds, and then when that is subtracted at two hundred pounds versus a 700 pound calf or 600 pound calf, depending on, on what you do. Um, that's your profit. That's, that's what your crop is, is that yeah. the growth of that animal. So no, it's, um, that's the best outcome I've ever heard of. Yeah. I'll start with this. So I, I did write just a quick comment about this, uh, blaming livestock and cattle has become a hot trend recently when it comes to global warming and greenhouse gases. I found this blog, which I'll have at the bottom of the uh, comment section as well, uh, that I originally thought argued just that stance that I was talking about, that trend. Um, I was interested to see that it took a more pragmatic approach toward the center of the argument, um, and it provided 10 overall arguments to assess the situation. And I'll outline them, and we can kind of either discuss them all at once or one by one, but uh, argument one, global data should not be used to evaluate local context argument two: further mitigation is possible and ongoing when it comes to greenhouse gases uh argument three restricting animal source foods offers a small net gain on carbon footprints very small dietary focus distracts from more impactful interventions five nutritional quality should not be overlooked when comparing foods six co-product benefits of livestock agriculture should be accounted for livestock farming also this is number seven livestock farming also sequesters carbon partially offsetting its emissions eight we rewilding comes with its own climate impact and i think that goes with like planting uh trees and so on and so forth that's how i understood it i think so argument nine large-scale a forestation not deforestation, large-scale afforestation of grasslands is not a panacea. And argument 10, methane should be treated differently than CO2. So those are the the 10 arguments outlined in a blog. Keep in mind, it's not a journal. It's not a study. It's just a blog, somebody's thoughts on what they what they had read, the sources they provided, and what they were kind of... It was more or less almost looked like a, a start to a dissertation is kind of how I read that. Mm-hmm. Um but thoughts on that? I was kind of surprised because origi- originally I saw that. I was like, oh boy, here we go. Um, but I was like, hmm, that's actually more in the middle than I thought. Because there's some stuff that I don't know if I would necessarily agree with, but I think it it gets the point across that, you know, we need to look at this as a whole contextual thing rather than just a momentary thing. So the problem is that um, people and their egos always want to boil it down to the simplest version possible and um, what they can control easily. And the problem with whole climate, CO2, methane, all of that is we are in a global system. The entire globe is involved. There are highs and lows in every single aspect of the climate and atmosphere. So Yes, we should do our part in minimizing pollution and and things in the air and being a good steward of the land like we do. We plant, we don't overgraze, those sorts of things. But even if everybody in the United States does their very best, what's going to happen on the other side of the world where there's coal plants being built weekly to... um, pollute the Asian skies to the point that no matter we have a very limited ability to impact it. Should we still make our contribution? Yeah, it's the right thing to do, but don't be dictating things that 
aren't going to make that impact and don't have the truly evil feel that it makes it sound like the cows do. They make such a small impact. Now, there's two things with that that I I think also two. So the recent most recent arguments, I love these. Uh, the first one being that um, per capita, the United States still produces more. I guess carbon footprint, uh, more greenhouse gases than like China. Yeah, that's easy when you have like three quarters of the world's population in one nation. And you even though you keep building things like you're saying with like the coal fired plants and whatnot. Yeah. Also, it doesn't help that some of our politicians, instead of flying coach or business class or something, they use their own private jets and they help attribute to that, right? Or contribute, sorry. Exactly. Um, the second part would they could be, drive too. They could. But the second part too is the fact that I find it funny we continue to blame the cattle when we just got done talking about how the cattle herd has been reducing for the past two to three years. And now we're recording True. one of the lowest herds since what what we say 1950s, 1970s. 71. 71. Thank you. <laughs> you know, like, hmm, how does that really work? <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, how about how about this? Well, this is... well, don't let the facts confuse you. Yeah. yeah. What about let's 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 take it from an, another more practical side. And maybe I can learn something by this that I'm just not overthinking it. But what's the first law of thermodynamics? Isn't it that there? I mean, it goes with energy, isn't it? With like Newton's laws, like no, no energy can be lost it's just energy conservation energy, energy cannot be created nor destroyed it's it just, just transfers transfers. From one form to another yeah yeah okay so let's, Ooh, let's take now this see argument that. of cows okay so let's take this this let's take this idea with cows eating grass creates co2 and methane right so let's take this argument you have a single blade of grass just, a, just one little tiny blade of grass. And it grows to maturity. It dries. It cures. And all of a sudden, it starts to curl up. And it decomposes. Complete decomposition. What's happened to the contents of that blade of grass? What has been, what has been not created, but what has been transformed from, from one form to another? From all your chlorophylls, your cellulose. What happens to that? Is yeah, that released just... into the atmosphere? And you have carbon sequestration from it, right? Right, yeah. Okay, so if you take it only, and a cow has been able to just miraculously somehow live without any feed at all, and it takes a single blade of grass, that one that is identical to it, and it eats that single blade of grass, and it digests it, it transforms some of those chlorophylls, those proteins, those, everything into meat, and then it poops out what's left over. Is there more or less of all of these CO2s, methanes, and all of the other byproducts of that decomposition? Is that created more by going through a cow? I mean, if you stick with Newton's laws, it's just the same it's amount the same. of energy. It's just been transferred same from life amount. form to life form. Yeah. And it's been done just a little bit faster. Sure. Yeah. So that grass is going to decompose anyway. Are you going to do it now or are you going to do it later? And what are you going to get out of it? And you're still going to get some carbon sequestration. So the argument to me is it's again, it's it's false. It's it's uh it's creating an issue, or they've got a they've got a problem they want to solve. So they had to create an issue to fit the problem solve so that they can control whatever it is that they need to control politically. They find something that'll work for their cause. So well, you can't tell me that cattle or anything eating it creates more than what if it, if that if that plant or that uh, whatever is being eaten would have on its own. And maybe by doing it quicker, maybe that uh, has some peaks and valleys to it that are better off because you graze off an entire area of ground well, and, and you sequester that carbon faster you're also maybe you're throwing better. more nutrient back into the soil right so the, it's a, to me again it's a, it's these false arguments um 
It's, well, I mean, it's not, we chase these you, all the time. What you keep providing though makes me think about this this other thing that I saw, and it said plant based is the newest meaningless marketing term used to dupe people who know very little about nutrition, but who kind of sort of want to eat better. Things that are plant based: sugar, vegetable oils, flour kid cereals, Jack Daniels, uh, cocaine, heroin. And it just left it at that. And I was like, hmm, you know, good point. <laughs> you know, it's true. I think that's well a good said. indicator. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It's, the, you know, we, I, I saw something here. Maybe you showed it too. I don't remember, but it talked about the 1970s that we were going to have an ice age where we, when we were kids, it was snowy and cold. Oh yeah. And it was Long predicted cold. that, you know what, we're moving into an ice age, 1980s, all of a sudden, oh my God, we have got to stop aerosols because we're going to lose the ozone layer. It's, it's done. It's over with. Yeah. So CFCs. there's there's always a, uh, impending doom and emergency. The 70s yeah. was the ice age because we had cold winters, lots of snow. Cyclic. And it was also very, the um, industrial cities of the United States were extremely polluted. Ooh, I said rain. E- EPA came along and came up with acid rain, which I mean, it's real. Um, and so EPA, which formed in the 70s, uh, cleaned up the air. Absolutely, it's improved. Um, some theories are that when they cleaned up the air, it altered uh, how much uh, solar energy could reach the earth. But again, that's only in the United States. So 70s was ice age. Ice age. 80s was acid rain and um yeah ozone fluorocarbons and, and the late 80s and 90s were the cfc's chlorofluorocarbons ruining the ozone oh there's a hole in the ozone there was a new technology that showed ah there's this hole well then they find out the hole is a venting system <laughs> and we don't hear about it anymore so it did well it doesn't fit the narrative it didn't it did it go away the hole no it's still there are we making it bigger i don't know you don't hear about it and so every decade or so, we have to come up with a new Oil is going to kill thing. us all. We're polluting yeah. everything. Um, you know, and so er, it, when, when it wears out. Now it's methane. Right. Well, but but the, wears, the other interesting thing with oil, too, is like you were telling me they found oil is actually to an extent renewable. It's not renewable super fast by any means right. like forest, like forests or anything like that. But it does reproduce very slowly because they're finding wells that dried up long ago that are now starting to produce again and that's i was like whoa right. that's crazy to think so that right. is do that right but i mean and not that any of the things we mentioned don't have some credibility impact. Sure. and impact that's not the thing it's the exploitation of there you go the issue that is the problem and then uh, getting on the bandwagon and trying to force everyone to follow a certain mandate or um, dialogue because this is what we want to talk about with consequences that do not benefit you. Right. You are you are held accountable and and oftentimes don't benefit anybody. anybody. Right. I mean yeah. that's the wild thing. Yeah. Well. Anyway, that's today's discussion about the egg population, cattle population uh upcoming potential prices rfid tags and now greenhouse gases and the other things that may or may not relate to cattle so uh i'll hand that over to mom and dad to give us the sign off yeah let me do this (laughs) because if you did it you'd overpay them so all we can do is thank you till you're better paid that's right